All right. So my name is Aaron Yarmel, and I'm joined here today with Roger Yates. Um, so welcome. Thanks so much for coming. Um, so Roger Yates is a lecturer in sociology at University College Dublin and the University of Wales, where he specializes in animal rights. Um, former executive committee member of the British Union for the Abolition of Vivisection, former Animal Liberation Front press officer, uh, co-founder of the Fur Action Group, and also co-founder of an organization called Vegan Information Project. So, uh, you know, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. I'm really thrilled to, to have a conversation and just, you know, explore some really important issues. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, so I, I took the time to, to, to read most of your, your doctoral dissertation. Um, you, you might be the only one who's ever done yeah. that. <laughs> And it was really, more people should read, it was really interesting. But one thing that struck out to me was, the, was, this, was this idea that, you know, you're really framing yourself as an activist scholar. One thing that you find frustrating and I find frustrating too, is when you have academic discourse that, that, that's not really trying to engage in any sort of praxis. Right? It's not really trying to engage with any sort of important project of, of social change. And I was wondering if we could just start by, by talking about that. Like, what is, you know, what does being an activist scholar mean, mean to you? Yeah, well, I suppose some people might even think that's a bit of a pretentious title, but um, it developed really, I was, when I was doing my PhD, there was um, another activist scholar uh, called Alexander Plows, and um, she was involved with the um, Earth First movement, and so uh, her PhD was on that, and mine was on, um, you know, the cultural um, support pillars of speciesism. So we kind of saw ourselves as kind of the bridge between academia and the movement so in in terms of how it'd be useful we, we saw ourselves as helping the movement we're involved with, with by bringing in some you know academic understanding to things hmm. um and vice versa by kind of translating if you like the movement to academia so we saw it as a two-way street in that sense that's really interesting it seems like there's sometimes a trade-off between the kind of nuance that we can bring as academics and the kinds of really blunt rhetorical tools that you need to, to mobilize lots of people. Um, can you speak to that at all? Yeah, it's a, it's a frustration for me in, in the sense that, um, you know, real life with bunny rabbit ears is, is you know, is kind of gray. And um, a lot of people would like it to be black and white. And that's what kind of rhetoric is all about. And so... Um, you know, subtlety in a social movement setting is often not kind of welcome in a way because people want to make a, it's almost like um, a soundbite kind of world uh, in social movements. And so this is interesting in the sense that, um, you know, some of the people who are founders of the animal rights position, like Tom Reagan, and people who were founders and pioneers of the vegan position, like the people who started the vegan social movement in 1944 in England, they weren't, they didn't really speak in sound bites. And so therefore, um, I don't think that they're, um, what they have to say um, resonates in, uh, so much in the sense that you actually have to look at what they say and kind of work it out because they're not going to punch you between the eyes uh, with what they say. Uh, they expect you to kind of, if you like, um, be able to contextualize what they're saying in, in the way that they do. And I don't think that a lot of, certainly a lot of the kind of um, new activists don't seem to be either willing or able to do that, uh, you know, which um, I, don't, I don't mean to be arrogant by saying that. It's just that um, I, I kind of go along with um, one of the witty things that Gary Francion ever said was that um, youngsters nowadays get for, uh, uh, fatigued by reading a tweet. And um, <laughs> I, I do think there is something in that, in the sense that if you do say to them, well, if you see this text, you kind of know if you present that on Facebook, it's not going to get read, you know, because that, it, that's just not the kind of thing that happens nowadays. Yeah, I think, I think what's fascinating is that there's these like filtering mechanisms that prevent nuance from making, I think, yeah, prevent nuance from really making it in. And um, the people who make it through the filters are the ones who will have these really quick sound bites that fit onto a slogan that you can put on your, your, your sign and carry around at a protest. And the ones who have the more nuanced position that I think we'd probably agree are closer to the truth um, are not going to make it through those filter mechanisms. Yeah, I think one of the frustrations for me, though, actually, is the fact that um, you don't you don't kind of get off um, first base uh, on, on this. And so um, I've recently uh, begun a Facebook page which is called Tom Reagan Legendary, 
uh, is because I feel um, it's very important for people to know his legacy, essentially, in terms of his ideas, rights-based animal rights. And, um, but there are some problems with Reagan. Mm -hmm. But I'm not quite sure if we'll ever get to those because, um, <laughs> you know, in, in the sense that that would require people to have got to stage one, as it were, and understood rights-based animal rights. And then we go, okay, so now we know the conceptual issues that we're dealing with and, you know, where they were coming from, product of their time and all the rest of it. And then you would move on to the subtleties. Like one of the big issues for Reagan is the fact that um, he began thinking about these ideas in the 1970s. Mm. And so that meant that when we got to the case for animal rights, which is a fairly difficult read, uh, and it's a very kind of dense philosophical text, um, but he, he drew quite a lot of it, including some of the most important parts of it, like subject of a life, this concept, uh, in a fairly conservative way. And I think it is because he wanted to move the conversation on. Well, I'm, in, I'm almost like in the same situation now where I'd like to be able to look at the problems of Reagan. But first of all, I've got to almost like establish who Reagan is now within the movement, which is called animal rights. It's very frustrating for me. Yeah, unless we can get people to this like, you know, first base where they're able to uh, understand what the ideas are and understand the power of those ideas and um, understand all that. Uh, they're not ready for the critiques yet. No, I, I, yeah, I think you're right. I, I mean, I, I, um, I was looking at um, some exchanges you had recently on Facebook and um, you, you went from animal liberation to practical ethics. Right, I did. Right. Yeah. yeah, and so, you know, again, it would, it would require that people had done, as it were, that, that type of groundwork, if you like. And it's very frustrating in the sense that um, you find that that's not really going to happen, you know. So when you talk about Reagan, Mm -hmm. You need to know something about uh, legal and moral rights, and you need to know something about negative and positive rights, you know. And so when you're dealing with people who, who don't, um, I, don't, I don't see the differences there, and in, including quite a lot of academics, you know, you, you, you see people attacking Reagan. You know, there, there was a, a famous televised um, a debate where one of the people opposing Reagan just took a legal rights position and he was there going, well, you know, he actually said in the sum, summing, I've got no evidence that you've read a single page of my stuff. And they're going, well, we have. He's going, well, I've got no evidence of it. So that's the kind of frustration that you get into, I suppose. Yeah. So, so, so given this, given this huge disconnect between the ways that, you know, academics talk about these issues and, and given, I think, some of the difficulties in really jumping into the nuances of, of Singer and, and Reagan, um, what do you think the role is that, that, you know, activist scholars can play in, you know, adding like some dialectical hygiene to the debate or, or you know, moving people forward and, and thinking about ideas? Well, actually, I find myself in the same situation that Reagan says he found himself in because he, he had great hopes about the case. Hmm. And um, he thought he'd kind of launched the animal rights movement proper, as it were. I and I also thought that if I was able to present some kind of insights from social movement theory, people would be kind of, wow, that's really interesting, on the grounds that they're in a social movement. Right. But they're not necessarily open to all that. They don't necessarily um, want to go there. And so I found it quite um, frustrating in that sense. And you, you then bas you basically have to limit your, your, your own position to, to the very basics of it. Mm. Um, because that's about the only, you know, the, that, that's, all you can go to in, in, in a way. And so you yourself, I mean, you know, if, if I was, I mean, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a sociologist, but if I, if I was to, to talk to you in depth now about the case, I'd probably soon get lost talking to you, you know, because I, I don't ever get to go there. I, I just get to go to the basics of it, you know? So. Yeah. I'm the same way when it comes to sociology. I, I got to take a, uh, a graduate seminar with, with the late Eric Olin Wright about theories of the state. Oh, right. And, you know, usually I, I could sort of follow that, what was going on, but there'd always be a couple of times where we get into this really depth, in-depth discussion where um, there would be some aspect of like some deep sociological theory that I didn't, that I didn't quite, you know, grasp. So it was, uh, mm. yeah. And, and I think that one thing that I find interesting about the way that you engage with ideas, is just how interdisciplinary it is. So you read through your, 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 your work and you, you've got everything from um, sort of feminist anti-porn activism to more like, you know, hardcore analytic animal rights 
ethics and a little bit of philosophy of biology. So you're thinking about like these challenges to species norms and how biologists don't agree about what a species is. And in the philosophical debate, there isn't like any like, you know, orthodox position about what the definition of species mm -hmm. is. And, you know, obviously a lot of, a lot of really hardcore sociology as yeah, well. Yeah, and there was obviously there's some psychology in, in there. And um, in terms of the influence that um, the Frankfurt School had on me, for example, then, you know, my favorite of, of those would be Marcuse. And that means a marriage of Marx and Freud, which, sure. which is very unusual sometimes, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, and another frustration for me, funny enough, going back to what we started with, really, is the fact that how um, psychology rather than sociology has taken off in the movement, in particular, sales psychology and kind of what I would regard as pop psychology, kind of very kind of shallow stuff. That's very frustrating for me. Yeah, I, I, so I've noticed the exact same thing. I think that you and I are both interested in using the best evidence we have to make, um, you know, to try to move the movement forward. We, we want to look at how social change happens. But for some reason, in general, the only evidence people talk about is evidence from like, like, like psychology and behavior economics. Like behavior economics dominates. And some of the social movement literature, we talk about like how do mass mobilizations work, gets left behind a little bit. And when it does get to you, there's this very superficial thing where they're like, oh, let's look at Erica Chenoweth's 3.5% rule. But they don't really delve into the mechanics of social change. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. And obviously, um, in, in the grassroots, um, the notion of victories is important. And in the more national corporate structure of the movement, then kind of what's sellable? Uh, I mean, I don't know whether you've picked up from my work that I'm very kind of critical of um, careerism in the movement. So it. it's not that I'm opposed to wages, uh, but I am kind of uh, um, opposed to the duplication that goes on. Mm. Uh, you know, and the fact that, you know, I, I've always said that, you know, some people come across an issue and they, like myself, I suppose, see a cause and other people come across that same issue and they see a career. Right. And I've always, I've always been a bit wary of that. To be honest. Mm. Yeah, that, I think that's really interesting. I mean, I imagine that there's got to be some kind of a balancing act to be done. Because on the one hand, yes. you want people to like take on some sort of social identity um, in order to like really be committed to it and to, to create these bonds of solidarity. And some of that has to be in the form of institution building. And once you move along that line, you need to have like some kind of a specialization of labor. And it's hard to do that without leading to some sort of like, you know, source of funding and career and all that. It's, it's a da there's a danger though, because I mean, um, social movement theory says that once you professionalize mm -hmm. and once you get your office and your press press offices and, and and all that and you start to delineate in terms of of these kind of uh, jobs as it were you know then there's a lot of pressure to moderate and um you know within the literature uh one of the famous cases would be greenpeace international you know as distinct from greenpeace london which was an anarchist group so yeah. greenpeace international saved the whales as it were uh, you know they are now a multinational uh, corporation and in the movement I suppose Peter would be uh, a, a, an equivalent for me anyway so yeah why don't we talk about this issue for a little bit there's a lot of things that happen when you try to become a more corporate structure you have to have a source of funding so you be, now you become sort of beholden to that source of funding if you're going to have a huge budget you're going to have to um, appeal to the interests of people who can give you a lot of money and usually that's going to push you to be more conservative um, now all of a sudden you have all these obligations to all of your employees. So that makes you even more dependent on that. And then as we get bigger and we get more money, we become less agile. So like yeah. one of my favorite cases is the, the, the Baton Rouge bus boycott during the civil rights movement. So what you, or sorry, no, I'm thinking of the Montgomery boys. What, yeah, they're different, slightly different dynamics, but in Montgomery, yeah. they, they wanted to have the help of the NAACP and the NAACP said, you know, we have to run this by our offices, you know, in New York. And they weren't able to just like quickly act and have this, this boycott. So then you had the Montgomery Improvement Association get founded that wasn't so tied down to these um, norms of like procedure and going through this chain of command and, and structure. And they were able to quickly mobilize all the different local church groups and get one of the most successful boycotts in the civil rights movement. Um, but so like, how do you see those dynamics playing out in the animal rights movement? Uh, well, I suppose I'd, 
I'd start with a, um, a t distinction between what goes on in the, in the grassroots and what goes on in the kind of corporate structure. Sure. Um, and I, th I think um, I think the most successful people in the grassroots are the ones who just use those kind of things as almost like a coach, you know. So, you know, today we're going to be this group and all that. And, um, and so then you would cast that off and things, you know. Mm. It, it's, it's, when, it's when you become more professionalized. Um, I suppose another way of dis discussing it is um, I'm, I'm okay about single issue events. I'm not so keen about single issue campaigns. Okay. Because, you know, because I actually agree with Francione, although he would, he, would, he would disagree with this, even though this is his position. Um, he agrees with single issue events because you can abolitionize them, right? Um, a single issue campaign is a bit more difficult, you know? So in other words, you can say, I'm an abolitionist. I, I believe in animal rights. I believe that our use of them is a rights violation. I'm today outside a circus because that is a form of animal use. I'm opposed to animal use, so therefore we're here. But any other time, we could be somewhere else, right? Mm. When you get into a campaign, there's a bit of pressure to go, oh, don't mention that, you know, because it's going to distract from what we're doing, or it might kind of taint what we're doing. Um, a classic example in, in my own experience was I took part in quite a few kind of TV um, debates during the run-up to the um, hunting ban, in, in Scotland, Wales, and, and England. And that often involved representatives of the Hunts Amateurs and also representatives of the League Against School Sports. And there was a time when the person from the League was trying to get the person from the SABs, the Hunts Amateurs, to take her fishing as a blood sports badge off because that was politically damaging for them. Okay. You know? And she, she came to all the SABs before we went on air, as it were, and said, you know, what should we do? And we go, well, that's their problem. You know, the fact that they don't want to mention fishing is the league's problem. The, mm. the fact is, from, from our point of view, it's a form of animal use, and so we would talk about it. But, you know, so in, in other words, you know, you would get this kind of decompartmentalizing going on and going, oh, don't mention that and don't mention this. You know, it, it doesn't happen so much now because we now see veganism as the moral baseline. So that, that kind of, um, you know, shh, don't talk about it is much less even even within the um, the national structure, but they've had to be kind of dragged there, kicking and screaming to get there. I mean, it's not so long ago that your animal aids and your mercy for animals, they um, they would be put, which is a completely kind of you know welfare group, you know, begging for mercy, you know. Anyway, but you know they they would have a strong video, and at the end they would go veg. Animal aid would ha would have um, veggie all that terrible thing, vegging, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all that, right. And it's only really the last five years where, where they've now realized that they can put vegan on it. Hmm. And the grassroots were always doing that. But we, we were forever being told that vegan is a scare word. Hmm. And now the reducitarians and the welfareists or whoever you want to label these people, the vegan strategists, of the world, uh, were telling were telling us this, and they've been proven completely wrong, mm -hmm. because people are not scared of the word. And now, when when I do outreach in Dublin, you've got buses going past our our location, and they've not only got the Go Vegan World adverts, but you've now got Subway, and other kind of commercial things with you know Vegan Your Way, and you know it's here the new vegan sausage roll and this kind of stuff. And so ve vegan, the word, is not what we were told it was. Uh, as, um, you know, even going back four years, we were told by the experts of the movement that if you use that word, you're going to be in trouble. And it's proven not to be the case. So wow. I, I, think, I think that the grassroots are a bit more risk-taking, I suppose, because they, you don't have the wages to worry about and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. So I, there's like a whole dissertation in, in that. In uh, yeah, right. yeah. And so are, you, are you going to do it on me? Right. Oh, I have to do it? I have to write? Um, so you know, why don't we, let's just go through some of those ideas in depth so that people watching it can you know, really, really grip them. So one of the things you talked about was Francione's views on single issue campaigns versus single issue events. Mm. And um, correct, so you'll, you'll have to correct me if I, if, I, if I misspeak at all, but it seems like, um, so for people who don't know Francione's work, he's 
He's an abolitionist. And when he uses the word abolitionist, he has a very specific meaning that he's talking about. He's not talking about simply people who desire the abolition of animal exploitation. He's talking about people who desire that and they follow a whole lot of other, um, like they have a lot of other commitments. And one of those commitments has to do with avoiding single issue campaigns. Mm. Um, And I think that the way he uses the word single issue campaign is that he's talking about something where we say, we're just going to fight to, you know, stop the exploitation of whales or something, or we're just going to, I'll fur. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or a fur. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have our entire campaign about that. We're not going to mention any other issues. We're not going to try to link it to the greater animal rights struggle. We're just going to focus on that for an entire campaign. And one thing that you just said that I, I didn't actually really get until now was this idea that he's okay with single issue tactics or like, like a single issue event within the context of a not single issue campaign. Yeah, the thing, the thing is, though, he would deny that. And he, he would say that he's opposed to it. But th- th- there's, uh, there's a subtlety t- to this. Um, he says, theoretically, a single issue event is okay because you can abolitionize it. But it's best to not say that because the only person he trusts to do it properly is himself. Okay. So, so th- 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 there's, there's that issue. The other real problem for Francione with his position on single issues is that his analysis is still embedded in the 1980s. So he'll talk about how people will stand outside a fur shop with their leather coats on and all this kind of stuff, right? And, you know, he'll make, make jokes about, well, you know, you, you, they're, they're not going to go up to the, to the bikers wearing leather and, and kind of um, criticize them in the same way as they would pick on, you know, particularly a, a, a female presenting person in a fur coat. They, they wouldn't do that. The problem is that there probably are no animal activists now who are going to stand outside a fur shop with, with you know, dressed head to foot with, with leather. That, that was something that stopped, uh, you know, in the 1990s. And it might have applied, you know, into the 80s, but no longer apply. When I first came to Ireland, for example, one of the people, one of the groups that was outside the fur shop every week was Vegan Island. Mm. So it was a vegan group, you know. Yeah. That there are other groups now which with a strong vegan message but they will do single issues on fur for example uh but they do it within an overarching vegan context and okay. actually francione's, francione's okay with that except he won't say it um he, he, you know, he is he is on record saying it and mm-hmm. apparently i was told that he's on record saying it about rodeos as well as circuses but he he will also say that he's totally against it and it go, goes back to the fact that he doesn't trust anybody to do it apart from himself. That's the problem. I mean, another thing we should say about Francione, and this is not a controversial thing to say, is that Francione is not part of the animal movement. He runs a counter movement, which he says himself, he, he runs a counter movement. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he, um, so therefore he's kind of almost like automatically critical of what goes on in the existing movement, often for very good reasons. But yeah. Um, yeah. So- but Let's he, talk about that in just a just second. Stand outside of the movement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I really want to delve into that. But just before we do, just so that um, we, we tie a nice bow on things. Um, with this idea of single issue campaigns versus uh, single issue events. So one thing Francione was critical of was Direct Action Everywhere's uh, campaign for the, the, the fur ban. And, and there was a, an interview between Wayne Chung and Francione that came out a little while ago. It was like, like a year or two ago. And yeah, on the Bob Linden show, probably, I would think. Okay, yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, you know, I think that'll be a nice segue into, into, like, we'll talk about, like, movements versus counter-movements. But what I'm wondering is, it, so it, it seems to me like there's nothing DXC could really do that would allow them to um, do a single-issue event that Francine would be okay with, because he doesn't see them as abolitionist. Is that, is that sort of fair? Where be, because, yeah, yeah um, f- first of all, uh, Francione um, is very angry with GXE for a, num- a number of, um, of, of reasons, some, some of which have uh, got a lot of grounding. But um, he would never have forgiven Sean for writing that pamphlet, which is Boycott Veganism. Right. And so Wayne Sean is saying that the, the, the moral baseline of the movement should be activism and not veganism. Well, Francione would never, would never kind of forgive him for saying that. And so therefore, 
he, uh, the way that trans, uh, Franz Jung would translate that is by saying, well, you don't stand for veganism. Mm -hmm. Because the way that it has to be with Francion is that you're unequivocal. And, and, and as, so, as soon as he perceives you as not, then you're not a vegan organization. And so there, therefore, that would then just take him straight back into the 1980s kind of thing about, well, I, you know, I bet your people are wearing leather and all this kind of stuff, which wouldn't be true. Mm -hmm. It's just that that's the way his model works in his head. And that would take him into that kind of analysis, you know. Got and it. then, you know, so you end up with Sean going, well, hang on a minute, you know, we're all vegans and everything. And you go, ah, yeah, but you're against veganism. You know, so it would end up being this kind of like shouting match in there. Yeah, okay, that, that totally makes sense. And I think this is a space where we need more activist scholars to engage because I, so I read his, I read his Boycott Veganism thing. Have you read Chong's Boycott Veganism? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that a lot of what he says could have been written using slightly different language by somebody who thinks that we should boycott um, consumer veganism or, or sort of boycott seeing vegan as like your primary social identity and then not having any sort of um intermediate tactics so I, yeah, so, yeah. Well, and another way where it comes out through sean mm -hmm. is the kind of like the one two three thing that people like earthling ed have have copied which, which okay. is that um you know you come you come across somebody kicking a dog are you familiar with this one mm -hmm. yeah. okay and so veganism is number two where you just don't intervene right whereas the activist gets in there and goes, you know, we're taking the dog, thanks very much, kind of thing. Right. The, the problem with that is that they do have a reduced view of, of veganism, as you're suggesting there, because there's nothing within the philosophy of veganism that says you just stand back and go, oh, I'm not having anything to do with that, right? There's, there's yeah. nothing in the philosophy that say that that's what veganism is. Yeah, so I think it's just people are using the words differently, and it's, it's leading to conflict that, um, that ultimately probably shouldn't be there. But... I think it's useful because, well, actually, maybe we can get into this, this point a little bit later, but let, let, let's go on to something that you just said about a minute ago. We were talking about um, Gary Francione running a counter movement. Yeah. So one thing that is difficult, I find, is drawing the boundaries of social movements because the moderate actors um, are typically thought to be part of a counter movement by the more radical actors. And if that happens, um, there's two ways you can go. You could say, well, the radical actors are just wrong. They, they just don't have a broad enough conceptualization of like what their movement is. And on the other hand, you might think, well, no, these are actually the movement, counter movement dynamics. So like as a sociologist, how do you distinguish between the dynamics of movement, counter movement dynamics and um, the dynamics of infighting? Ooh, yeah, well, that, that's, um, yeah, we could talk about that for a, a long time, I guess. <laughs> Another dissertation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. I'll, I'll get scribbling straight away. <laughs> the, um, yeah, because obviously you, you do have, if you like, um, a pure form of this, which, which, is, which is the counter movement, which is actually outside and oppositional to the movement. Right. So uh, one that I would know from the States would be, it's called... Um, uh, the National Animal Interest Alliance. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they, they, they kind of position themselves as an anti-animal rights position. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the, where you get more difficulty is, is where you get to the infighting is where you end up with people within a movement acting as, a, as you know, within that kind of sociological thing, which we call movement, counter-movement dialectic. This kind okay. of like, yeah, this kind of like fight between the counter-movement. So, Really, at that stage, you're talking about different factions within a movement rather than the counter movement. The, the, the complication within, created by Francien, I suppose, is that he wants to be called a counter movement, even though a lot of people would see him as part of the movement. And France, Francione is, um, he uses different language. He will use we language when it suits him, and he'll also say, I'm not part of you when it suits him as well. I see. Yeah. So it's like, we, we better change, but also I'm not part of you. Yeah. Yeah. And so just, just to really sharpen this idea, I, I think that there's some times where I can point to something and say, this is clearly infighting. A lot of times, I think the conflicts are about things like the control of resources. They're about things like personality clashes. Um, there's ideological differences about things that are, you know, slightly different than the main issues within the movement. 
Um, so like there could be things like, do you prefer anarchist structures versus more top-down hierarchical structures? And I think that when those dynamics characterize the conflict, then I can say, okay, yeah, this is like, this is what infighting looks like. So I have a pretty clear picture of that. So imagine you have somebody like, I don't know, um, Wayne Pacelli. I don't know if he would say this, but imagine if Pacelli were to say something like, uh, Francione is just the radical part of our movement. And then you have Francione saying, no, I'm not part of your movement. I'm part of a counter movement. Um, who's right? And how do we figure out who's right? Uh, well, there's a complexity there because of what I said before, the fact that, you know, so sometimes, you know, you've got this um, utility to move in and out of it, you know, you know, and that, you know, if you, if you're, as it were, being invited as a guest speaker within something within the movement, then suddenly you're within the move, you know, so it's, it's very difficult then for you to maintain those boundaries, I suppose, mm. um, which, which is, Francion tried to do that by creating um, the, uh, the vegan summit, mm. which was, was his own conference, right? Uh, and, I, and again, that was to kind of keep the purity of it, because I, I feel that if he goes to the farm type thing, or he gets invited to a veg fest, wherever, he feels a bit tainted by that because he's kind of having to, as it were, come away from the counter movement into, and then it's all infighting then. But I don't actually think he thinks it, as you kind of alluded to before, I don't think he sees himself as infighting. Right. Because he's not in, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So, you, I mean, you've got to be in to be, you know, part of the in gang, right? And, and because he's not, he doesn't really see that he, he almost like sees himself as an outside observer being mm. critical of something else you know and yeah. but then of course you do then have the history of he's being kind of um pushed out mm -hmm. if he will feel that and that actually was one of the things that split him from tom reagan because they, they were colleagues at one point and then that goes all the way back to the 1990s where there was a crisis of are we in or are we out type of thing? Got and it. Francione, Francione was much more cool about being out. And Reagan was, um, I think, was taken aback by the viciousness of what was going on. And he kind of withdrew from the isolationist thing mm. and decided to try and work within, even though acknowledging the limitations of what was going on there, which was, I'm not really going to get people to understand the right space position too well. But I'm still going to be okay about being an insider to that. You know? Okay, good. So it seems like one criterion that is at play is this idea of self-identification. So if, mm. if I self-identify as part of the um, of the outgroup, and other people treat me like I'm part of the outgroup, and I criticize the in-group, and I have like my own separate organization, um, then that should be sufficient to call me part of. Um, like a counter movement rather than infighting. Yeah, I mean, the same goes on with if you identify as activist mm -hmm. r rather than, you know, I mean, look, there's a lot of, you know, cupcake vegans versus activists, right? Mm -hmm. So they're constructing in and out groups there. Oh, yeah, yeah good. Uh, but I think, so, all right, so, so Francian, maybe we can solve with that, with that criterion. We could just say he's part of the out group because people treat him like an out group and he self identifies as the out group. But suppose we have your cupcake vegans and your cupcake vegans say, um, look, I'm, this is what vegan activism is. Like we need to give people cupcakes and mm. you know, we're not, we don't do just cupcakes. We also do um, cookies and we might give some fake vegan, you know, vegan, like not from a list of consumer goods now. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. We just go through different consumer goods and, you know, doing all this innovation and they say, yeah, we're part of the movement. Mm. Um, like so, I think self-identification can't be sufficient because I think well, we you can to... resolve that though by the broad church idea, right? You you yeah. could you could still say okay, you, you're so let's think about it in broad church, different wings, yeah, and all that. And so you might think in terms of wings rather than factions because factions seem to be oppositional. Wings just seem to be more kind of well, they're over here and you know all that. And so you could you could see it that way. And I suppose. The way that that kind of works is that you have kind of alliances within the movement. Mm -hmm. And then the key to keeping those alliances going would be to, for them not to criticize each other. Okay. Because that's usually the thing that creates the wings become infighting because they won't not criticize each other. 
Yeah, that makes if, sense. If you stop them doing that, then you can carry on and be in the broad, broad church. It's like a political party. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. And then eventually, you know, you might have to break up the church and yeah, that we get Anglicanism. Yeah, um, you go, right, you know, I, I'm now going to form my own thing. Yeah, so. yeah that's interesting. Uh, maybe a more helpful way of framing this, this question about when does a counter movement become a counter movement as opposed to like, just infighting has just this might have to do with the usefulness of various character categorizations for certain kinds of questions. So, so I think that it is, it is fruitful sometimes to ask about the strategic articulate so sort of the, the general level of coordination and competition within the animal advocacy movement where like what we're doing is we're, we're just thinking about anybody who does anything with respect to advocating for the animals. For, yeah. yeah. For the animals. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we can talk about those dynamics and there could be fruitful questions to ask there. And there's other times that there's fruitful questions to ask about, you know, if we're thinking about Francione, we're thinking about the abolitionist movement, like there's fruitful questions to be asked simply about the abolitionist movement. And there we want to conceptualize him as a counter movement to this means, you know, the, the, the new welfare as, as, as he would term them. It might be at the end of the day that really we, all we have to do is, or what we're left with doing is saying, for the purpose of the question I'm asking, does it make more sense to conceptualize this as movement, counter movement dynamics or as infighting? Yeah, it could be, but also, you know, it's a very fluid situation because, you know, um, you know, people can kind of come together on some issues and, and, and then not, you know, and also, I mean, I say, I think one of, one of the big, um, you know, the, the big uh, things that you, we need to discuss here is that are the outcomes the same? Mm. So welfare outcomes are different from abolitionist outcomes. Uh, which are kind of um, put into a soundbite by Tom Reagan, you know, we don't want bigger cages, we want empty cages. Then you've got the complication of new welfareism, which is like in the middle of, of that. Mm -hmm. um, so we can then, I mean, like I can think back to when I ke came into the movement, which is 1979. Um, it's really fascinating for me now looking back because we saw a welfare group like Compassion and Well Farming, this is in England now, as part of the, the animal movement. Whereas we saw the vegan society as just the food group. Right? Mm, okay. So it was a really kind of weird kind of construction of who was in and who was out. So the League Against Cool, cool Sports was in. The, the vegan society, well, they're just the food group. Um, you know, I always tell the tale about the fact that, you know, we went through the 80s without talking about veganism, which modern day vegans just look at you and go, how, how did you do that, you know? Yeah, we just did because we were in those single issues, you know, and we would forge alliances and, and stuff. And I remember going down to, you know, I was in Liverpool um, at the time and you'd go and you'd put on your compassion and farming hat and go along with somebody. Hmm. And then, you know, the next week you might be there as representative of the ELF, you know, yeah. but it, it was it was a bit kind of bizarre, but it was a little bit like taking coats off and putting hats on and stuff and, and just going, well, I can talk about that, you know? And of course, what I can do now in a more academic sense mm -hmm. is that if people ask me questions which raise all that complexity, I can actually say now as an academic, well, there's a range of views about that yeah. in the movement. So if you want an armor welfare uh, argument there or, or a solution, then that's what th this is what this would say the more abolitionists would come in and say, well, no, we're not that, we're, we're somewhere else. And then you've got this kind of complex mix, this kind of messy thing in the middle as well. Mm. But you, ca you could actually look at the spectrum if you wanted to and analyze it for that. Not, not so great on the radio because you don't get the time to do that, but right. you, could do it. you could do it, yeah. Yeah, so that is interesting. And I love that you, so you brought this up a couple of times, but there's like the, the fluidity of it, where I think you think of grassroots activists as people who have the agility to be able to say, I'm going to take off my, um, my HSUS hat today and put on my ALF hat. And then tomorrow I'm going to do this other kind of, other kind of thing. Maybe I'll I, I push. Think, I think that applied to the past, not so much now because of the vegan okay. thing. Because the, of the what? The, the, the vegan, the vegan okay. thing is almost like a glue now, I think. Got it. it acts as a kind of glue. Um, and so you don't, you don't get called upon to be a single issue person anymore now, like we used to be. So you'd get all these hunt saboteurs and militant people and you go, you know, can, can you, can you talk about this uh, campaign to, um, you, you know, to, to make, to abolish say the Baron battery cage. Right. Mm. And we'd go, yeah, okay. And, and you'd go, 
and and not not by going well we're vegans and we're just going to talk to you about that because you've asked us to we'd actually limit ourselves to, to the criteria that they imposed on us we wouldn't do that anymore you know be, because they the conversation would be about veganism straight away it, it wasn't the case you could go through an entire you could go through an entire series of interviews without talking about veganism and if you were there as an anti-blood spots person you wouldn't talk about flesh consumption. You know, you, you would keep yourself in a box. It was like tunnel vision, you know? I see. Okay. I mean, I, so I see some people doing campaigns like that today. So yeah, this isn't going to be a perfect analogy, but there's, there's something called the, the hen heroes program. And I think it's a mercy for animals program. And what the, what, what happen is you'll, you'll, you'll sign up for it. And they'll say, okay, tomorrow I want you to all go on McDonald's Facebook page and ask them about, um, can we see your chicken welfare policy? Or when are you going to take meaningful chicken welfare reforms? Mm. Or, you'll, or you'll like, so, okay, go to this amusement park, park's website and say, hi, I'd like to read your chicken welfare policy, something like that. And it seems like what they're recruiting are activists who are willing to um, put themselves in a box for a couple of minutes and just say, yeah, I'm just going to do this one particular message, mm. not veer off, not talk about uh, veganism, or at least uh, maybe you're allowed to, but, maybe, but you're not really being asked to. Yeah. Um, I think that for the most part, that's not what I see in the grassroots. Like, I, I think that if you show up to, I don't know, any sort of animal rights protest, you're not really going to be asked to say, you know, just focus on fur. It's, it's going to be something where you, you can always um, promote your veganism as well. Um, and that, that's a fascinating change. And I think that it, it helps contextualize a lot of Francione's ideas. Uh, this is really helpful for me because I didn't, I didn't quite understand the dangers of single issue campaigns or single issue tactics. And so we think about it as happening during a time when activists would just put on your ALF hat today or put on your hunt saboteurs hat tomorrow and still be wearing um, leather because there wasn't more of like a comprehensive vision of veganism mm. yeah well of, co of course now everybody's going to turn up to everything with their t vegan tattoos so um so, you know so in in other words the the the, ve the vegan thing i suppose has kind of um resolved quite a few of those issues now mm. That's it. um in in the sense that um it, it's almost like when i think back to my former self it, it d didn't really make sense what we were doing except then it did yeah you know um because that's what we were kind of asked to do and we were kind of um willing to go along with it and we i suppose we we di we didn't have in the background then you know the Francion and the reagans to go yeah but you know uh, no nobody did that to us you know sure so, mm. that's fascinating so i think one other issue that i think needs to be talked about during discussions of movement counter movement dynamics is the way that charges of, of uh, infighting can be weaponized. So one thing that I've seen a lot lately are people from the humane farming movement. And they'll say things like, oh, we're all on the side of trying to help animals. Why are you vegans criticizing us? Why don't you work with us? Um, why are mm -hmm. you doing all this infighting? And I think that's a clear case. We want to say, no, we're not, we're not part of your movement. This is, I think you, you must have misunderstood what it is that we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, we want to end... Like, we don't want bigger cages, we want no cages. And is that something that you've seen? Is it happening more often today than that? Yeah, I, actually, I, I think um, so, something happened um, just last um, Sunday, which I think is what you're talking about here. Um, and I think uh, when you start to analyze it, it's kind of like what, what happened in this thing I'm just about to tell you is kind of like partly our fault, I think in the sense that this guy came along and I was putting up our big banners on the street. And he said, um, oh, this is all just craziness. Hmm. And I turned and I didn't, I didn't criticize his ableist language, but I, I could have done. But I, I kind of said, what, what do you mean, you know? And he goes, well, you know, all this. And he goes, um, you know, it's not cruel. You know, in other words, to use as animals, that's what he was saying. And I said, well, well, actually, you know, we're not actually focused on what's cruel and what's not. We're, we're focused on rights. Mm -hmm. And he goes, no, you're not. His, his response to me was, no, you're not. And it was almost like, well, look, I've, you know, I've seen a few videos and all that. And, and you know, all your people talk about cruelty all the time, which is true. 
-hmm. You know, if, if you, if you look at the, the stuff that the, you know, the YouTube superstars talk about, you know, I mean, it's distressing the generational difference now because you've got people like Earthling Ed talking about being an animal lover. Mm -hmm. our, our generation would never do that, you mm -hmm. know? And because we'd be saying it's not about loving, it's about respecting and this kind of stuff because it's much more rights-based in those days. And you've got, you know, um, people like um, Joey Carbstrong, who's seen as the militant of the movement, mm. um, talking about cruelty all the time, right? Yeah. And um, nobody, nobody talks about rights violations. Mm. And so in some ways, it's our fault that the public get it wrong. And it's our fault that when journalists come along and ask us a bunch of questions, you know, I, I'd be inclined to say, well, you know, you're asking me about welfare here, you know, but, you know, well, why is that? Because we talk about welfare all the time. We, 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 we talk within the welfare paradigm. It's almost like, oh, don't be cruel, don't be cruel. And we, we forgo the much stronger claims making, which is based on other animals, the rights bearers. We talk about rights holding. We're talking about human use of other animals being rights violations. There's very few people who talk in those terms. So if people get it wrong, well, you know, why wouldn't they? Yeah. yeah. So we open ourselves up to those sorts of attacks by focusing on welfare all the time. And then it's no wonder they think that we're part of the same movement as the... the yeah, and that's, that's what, that, what causes confusion because it kind of, well, you're using the same language as us, so surely you're the same as us. But, and then you go, well, no, you know. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I always, I remember going back to the 1990s when Shaq ar arrived and, you know, and um, the C in Shaq is cruelty, animal cruelty, you know. So stop hunting and animal cruelty. And, and I thought... Um, that's a, strange, that's a strange word to use it in your very title because you, you don't want non-cruel experiments. You want no experiments at all. And so you, you're immediately confusing things by embedding yourself in the welfare paradigm by using that, that, that term. You know, and it, it's always confused me, but you still, you still get it now. All the major spokespersons uh, and all the banners and all the slogans Animal cruelty, animal cruelty. You know, very few people talk about rights violations. I'm fascinated by, by some of the rhetorical choices that different groups, groups use. So one thing I'll clarify is I'm not part of direct action everywhere. I'm not really part of any, sort, any groups. But one thing I've, I've looked at is DXC's rhetoric and some of their signs. And like one of their slogans is human freedom, animal rights. Another one they'll say is their lives, not ours. Mm -hmm. um, their eggs, not ours, things like that. And... I think that's about as close as you can get to putting a rights message in like, like on like a little postcard. But the first time I saw that, I was, I was really happy because I was thinking, okay, cool. Like here, here's people who aren't just talking about cruelty or, or suffering. Here's like some messaging that's focusing on rights. No, I think, I think, I think it would be, have to be more systematic than that. Yeah. And just for people to understand what they're doing when they're using that kind of language. Otherwise, it'll just be another slogan. You know, it's not food, it's not violence. It's kind of like pe people, you know, like in sociology, there's a this discipline called ethnomethodology. And within that, there's an idea called indexicality. Okay. And it's almost like, you know, people have got these slogans in their head and they kind of apply it to whatever seems to be appropriate. Got it. Well, you, you know, so in, in, in other words, a lot of people with those signs and even maybe say it, wouldn't pick up on the fact that what you just picked up on, well, this is much more right space than usual. They, they wouldn't necessarily see that. I see. So this could be an issue of like, like, like having my ability to see clearly impaired by spending too much time in academia, where I see something as like a signal for, oh, great, rights, but that's not really what's going on. No, not, well, so, certainly no kind of systematic, re, uh, it, you know, it wouldn't be a kind of like, you know, I am, I am writing a rights based slogan here. It, it right. wouldn't, wouldn't be that. Or, or um, if, for example, there was a bunch of those and you get people come along, they'll just probably grab the one on the top. They wouldn't, I mean, I, I'd be leafing through to find those ones. Right. Be, because because of, of the message that I would want to want to put out. But yeah. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought that that would be the general case. Um, you know. That's right. And, and, you know, and, and there is a, um, I see it going the other way too, where I'll see organizations that say, we are explicitly an abolitionist organization um, and they, they don't want utilitarians around, like, like they, 
I, well, I think part of that has to do with misunderstanding of what utilitarianism is. Um, but but they're they're very committed to this abolitionist line. But then you look at what they do, and they have single issue campaigns. Yeah, I I think that you know if Francine was sat here with us, he'd just say, well, people just don't understand. That's 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 what's the problem. Yeah, and, you know and one I mean? thing, um, just to like you know on, on this point, I think one reason why a lot of academics are terrible teachers is because we're the people who were weird enough to benefit from the from a certain style of teaching and then decide to stick to stick with it and never want to leave school. Um, but there's no guarantee that the methods that work on us are going to work on your typical student who does not want to go into academia. So I think that there, there's certain kinds of like ways into animal rights or ways into the advocacy movement. That's the same thing that like attract people like us, but just aren't going to be the things that are attracting uh, most people. And yeah. No, but I mean, I, I think partly is because there's not an agreement about what we're looking at right you know i mean we 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 we, we, we don't do that and and of course um movements also move they evolve which mm-hmm. which i i obviously agree with because it's just a, a you know an actual fact um my own position on that and the work i've been doing for the last few years is being trying to encourage people new to the movement to learn about their movement hmm. and to the to the extent that i'm a bit kind of flabbergasted by the fact that a lot of people come in to a movement and go, okay, I'm now going to decide what, what this movement is. And I always use the idea that somebody would, as it were, join the Marx, the Marxist movement uh, without ever bothering to check out who Marx was mm-hmm. or what Marx stood for. Um, you know, because even, even the people who have moved away from Marx, like the neo-Marxists and critical theorists, this kind of stuff, they could explain Marx, mm-hmm. you know, the, the the people in in our movement now or the animal movement now who would reject the human rights element of it couldn't explain it mm. they, they they don't know what they're rejecting almost it's just that they they got no this this is for me veganism is this or animal rights is this and you know i'm not going to be able to talk around that because that that that's it that that's what they want it to be and so, you know, I, I often say, well, you know, there's a lot of people in the movement now who want veganism and animal rights to be a certain thing, whether it is or not. They, they just got a, a vision that they're happiest with and they, they just plow that thorough kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people who tell me that they're Marxists and they have no idea what Marx thought the role of capitalism was in transforming the means of production. Yeah, right. well, I and, mean, that, that to me is just weird. Because, bizarre. I mean, the, fir- the first thing I did when I joined the movement Mm-hmm. was read up about it you know i was i was quite hungry for it because i mean it was all in magazine form though in those days yeah. um you know and you would go uh, and you'd you'd go and, and say to people you know have you got any old old mags that you know mm-hmm. and you'd actually check it out you know I, re- I remember actually going through magazines and having to write down all the um you know the phrase you know what what does rspca mean what you know and all that kind of stuff you you had to write them all down until you become versed in talking about the movement in these kind of terms you know and using all the you know the conceptions and everything and and uh, all the conceptualizations the way the way things are constructed you have to learn that there's there's less of that going on i I think and probably in the marxist movement too maybe people in the marxist movement are complaining about it in the way that I complain about this movement, you know? I'm, I'm sure. And, you yeah. know, this is one of the reasons why I was so interested to talk to you, um, because uh, when, when I've seen, I see, I see you write and um, communicate with people, and you're really, uh, you know, really deeply cued into the history of the movement and um, a really deep understanding of what all the different ideas are. And I think that you can give really important context for um, the things that people say, and not only that, but but you've you subjected things to really critical scrutiny. There, there are people who are critical of what I do in really? the sense that um, so, some some people um, suggest, for example, if if we to think about um, veganism and the vegan pioneers of the social movement, mm-hmm. um, they they would say that I'm probably trying to make veganism do too much work. Hmm. Um, in, in, in the sense that um, I characterize veganism as a justice for all movement, 
And if yeah. you look at the writings of the people who started the vegan social movement, um, who were largely male and all white, uh, which is an issue in itself, obviously. Um, but if you look at their values and what they thought the movement was, they're much more radical than modern day vegans. Hmm. You know, they've, they've got a, a greater kind of um, aspiration for it. Uh, it. It had much more of a kind of utopian kind of um, aspect to it. And it was because, uh, as we say in sociologists, you know, people are a product of their time. And so if you go to an early sociology book, it, if you go to an early um, philosophy book, then there's going to be sexist language in there. There's going to be language we should, we, which we don't use now. But, but their, their vision was very radical. And they, they, were, they started a peace movement during World War II. I always put World War II in a bit of commas, because obviously it wasn't totally global. But we see it as a global com conflict. But World War II wasn't long after World War I. Mm -hmm. And you had people who started the vegan movement trying to work out what had happened to humanity, what had made us so violent. I mean, they, they just witnessed the third right, right in front of them. Mm -hmm. And they're thinking, what the hell caused that? You know, we've got the potential to be a peaceful species. What has gone wrong? And they came to the conclusion that veganism was a large, if not the dominant, part of the solution and so they talked about a vegan mindset and a vegan future which would be non-violent or less violent and so this was before second wave feminism it was before the civil rights movement and everything and um i tend to think that um they probably did think of um in a vegan world there would be no domestic violence and there would be no sexual violence and you know it would transform us because now people are going well veganism is one thing but it's not the end it's not the solution to everything they actually saw it as the solution to everything hmm. you know i mean donald watson said that the vegan movement was the greatest cause on earth hmm. and he talked about other movements as lesser movements and hmm. he used the metaphor of the titanic he was saying the other movements are rearranging deck chairs we are focused on on the, the iceberg the the big issue you know which was violence um you know uh, the lack of peace mm -hmm. uh you know all those kind of things that's 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 how the early vegans saw it and they incorporated what they would then call ecology which we would now call environmentalism there was a big concern in those days about the quality of the soil for example mm. you know which um you know i i always say that that came back into the movement in the 1980s through john robbins work i don't know if you're familiar with diet for new america yeah. Yeah, and so he started talking about you know topsoil. You know, are we actually going to be able to grow the food that humanity needs and this kind of stuff? These are fundamental questions for the early vegan pioneers. You wow! Know. Oh and, yeah, I mean that is fascinating. I, I, so I think that when a lot of people hear a phrase like vegan, like the vegan movement is the most important movement, um, they, they they get bothered by that because they don't have an understanding of what veganism really meant to the early the early you know pioneers where. It's not this idea that we're going to get people to eat plants. It's this comprehensive rejection of, of violence. Yeah, they saw themselves as a, of the peace movement, but also a phrase that they used a lot, especially um, someone called uh, Leslie Cross, mm -hmm. was that veganism was part of the moral evolution of humanity. And okay. so they, they, I mean, they used kind of language which we found a bit difficult now. I mean, they would talk about savagery and we, we become kind of beast-like and this kind of stuff you know the kind of stuff that we wouldn't say but what they're getting at of course is they're trying to say we've really kind of you know slid down the ladder here you know uh you know snakes and ladders here we've we've, we've you know we're, 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 we're down to square one we've, we've got to build ourselves back up again and so when you get a modern day person like gary roski for example who sees humanity as a parasite and they're almost like become anti anti-human i mean you know, Yorosky says he, he, he hates humans, including himself, right? The, the early vegans kind of loved humans to the extent that they thought, again, using a kind of uh, Reagan idea, that they could love people into the movement hmm. and transform them into peaceful beings who would reject the violence, which they've just lived through. They actually just lived through it. I mean, it's a historical fact for us now. They, they were part of it. And so the vegan movement, 
was started in 1944, the last years of the Second World War, they declared peace during a, glo a global conflict. Hmm. That, that's how radical they were. Wow. So I guess like one way of positioning, I think what you're doing is that you would like us to get back in touch with our radical roots. Or at least know about them. Okay, at least know about them. To, to, to the extent that even if you want to reject them, mm -hmm. I think you should know what you're rejecting. It's yeah. not good enough to just go. I mean, I, I've, I've said to people online, well, you know, just, just as long as you understand that what you're saying is completely opposite to what the founders of our movement would say. Right. Uh, and they would come back and say, F the founders. Right. Don't give a shit about the founders. Don't even know who you're talking about. You know, because for them, veganism starts with people like Gary Roski. Sure. You know, and so the politics of the movement, this goes back to infighting. The politics of the movement has changed. It was, it was a left-leaning movement. You know, Steve Best has got a famous uh, video called uh, Total Liberation, mm. where he says, wherever your personal politics, we are a left-wing movement. Our values are left-wing. Just look at our values. Where do you think they come from? They come from the left and the left-leaning ideas of history. You know, we reject right-wing values, you know, nation and walls and you know, all the stuff that Trump stands for. We, we, you know, these are not our values, you know? Yeah. I, so, um, maybe, so here's just like one, one other thing I'd just love to, to, to ask you about. And it's the idea, and I'm, I'm wondering about diversity within the movement and specifically diversity of strategic orientations. So like, suppose we accept this idea that we need to get back to our roots. We need to get back to these, these roots of radical abolitionism and, and criticisms of you know, violence, and it's, it's a very comprehensive sort of doctrine. Um, we're not going to, yeah, so, so we, we have that, and we, and we really need to shift more in that direction. Um, do you see a role for there being some, like, more welfare organizations, like Human Society of the U.S. or um, other groups like that? I'm, I'm not sure that we need any organizations. Got it. I, th I think in the age of the internet, I'm not quite sure why they're needed, really. I mean, you obviously you've got to get people to come together, but you know, we can we can do that online. Um, I, as I was saying before we came on air, as it were, you know, I'm based in Ireland, and there are no national group structures. There isn't a, a corporate structure in Ireland at all, okay. and yet we're doing fine. You know, oh. we we don't we don't we don't need them. Uh, you know, uh, we don't need them to tell us what to think or what to say. We can work that out ourselves through talking to each other and stuff. And so um, I would be critical of uh, the groups, whether, whether they would be welfareist or whether they see themselves as a rights thing. I'm not quite sure in the age of the internet whether they're even needed at all, to be honest. Okay. Um, I'd like two questions about that, but I guess the, the first one I'll ask is- Where my anarchist a bit comes out, is he? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I like anarchists, so you're fine people. Um, what, what I'm wondering is, um, one way of I think reframing the question in light of that is to think, is there room for some people who are pushing for welfare reforms? Um, I, I did some work actually with Gary Francione about this, okay. and um, I used uh, some work by a sociologist called Richard Gale, and what, um, what most people do when they think about movements and counter movements, they think of that kind of dyad. Mm -hmm. Whereas what Gail brought in was the state or state agencies. And so it became a triad. And there was a complex relationship between the movement and the counter movement. And then what the counter movement said to, to the state and what the movement said to the state. Now, what tends to happen is, and I always use, um, uh, a circus example here is when we talk animal rights, when we do talk animal rights, um, they talk back to us in welfare because that's all they can do. Got right? And so you tend to say, um, you're outside a circus and you go, other animals have rights. What you're doing is a rights violation. And they go, oh, well, the welfare group of just inspectors and, and, they, and they think we're, we're, everything's fine and dandy. Right. So they, they respond with welfare because they can't respond with rights. Okay. So when, when, they, when they also are in conversation with the state, then they have to translate all that into welfare as well. 
Uh, and so you get a situation where you get a minister saying to say circus proprietors, look, we're getting a lot of flack here because of, of what's going on in your circus. You've got to tidy it up. That automatically means some kind of welfare reform because that, that's how they think, right? It, it wouldn't satisfy us, but they're not trying to satisfy us. They're trying to get the, the media and, and the public off their back. So by, by advocating animal rights, you get welfare anyway. Mm, okay, cool. So suppose you're somebody who cares about welfare reforms. You might think that the most effective way of doing that is actually pushing for rights. Yeah, because um, and the, the reason why it's not done is going back to the victory thing, because you, you, you need, um, if you've got wages and also you just want to wave a flag, you've got to say, we had a victory. So we did X and that made, you know, Y do, do this, right? Yeah. Uh, whereas if you just then go, well, you know, Ringling Brothers have closed down, this has happened, that's happened. And we reckon that along the way, we probably had an effect on that somewhere. That, that's not good enough. We want to say, we want to create the causal effect. Right. I see. And so an example would be Peter, um, they use the word of forcing KFC to gas chickens rather than cut their throats. Yeah. They, they declared that as a victory. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that kind of thing was coming along anyway. And this is one point that Francione makes over and over. But what, um, what the welfare corporations do is they look at the industry journals, which is true. They, they, they read the journals. So they know what's in the wind. Mm -hmm. And they go, well, you know, um, we, we're finding out now, because the real big problem with factory farming is the fact that everybody just thought, just cram them in, that's more profit. And then they, they realize they're dealing with real living beings. Mm -hmm. And so they realize then that they're going to have to back off. And so veal crates become group things with, with you know, rose veal and this kind of stuff. Uh, Barren battery cages become enriched battery cages because they're trying to correct the faults that they created themselves by just intensifying too much. So they don't want to get rid of anything. They just want to kind of ease off a little bit to make it, you know, because it, you know, it's a bottom line and economics and all that. And so the movement gets the wind of that and go, okay, we're going to now start pushing for what was, is going to happen anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. Which ironically means that what was going to happen anyway gets delayed because the, the industry doesn't like to be pushed around. Yeah. And, okay. and so they don't want us to be able to say we did that even if they were going to do it anyway. And of course, the farmers are going to get onto the reps and going, you know, we, we, we can't allow ourselves to be pushed uh, around by the animal rights movement, so-called, be, because it's a thin end of the wedge. And so it becomes a very complicated political issue then. Whereas if you'd have just left it alone, you'd have probably got the enriched cages earlier. You know, and the, the, move, the movement towards gassing, which is called controlled atmosphere killing, Mm -hmm. or control atmosphere stunning right that that was happening anyway and if you didn't make it a campaign it could have happened quicker anyway good okay so i see there being like two critiques in there of welfare reforms one of them is that there's a causal inefficacy problem or maybe it's just over determination where um you have a lot of people taking credit for welfare reforms but you're pushing for welfare reforms might actually have delayed them um, so it might have been even making them less likely if, if what you care about is welfare reforms, or it might have just not really had an effect. Um, or we see people taking victory, you know, calling, like saying that, you know, we, we've, we've got these promises, right? So it'll be like, we, you know, Tyson has promised to make these changes to their supply chain by the year 2025. And um, it hasn't happened yet, but they're still raking in all these donations. And I think a lot of that goes into the ossification that happens when social movement organizations, um, you know, become prof professionalized where all of a sudden they have this donor base. Now they have to have this like series of, of things that come in. Um, so I completely on board there, but I think there's another like level of the criticism that I'm really interested in, in getting your thoughts on. And it's this idea that I think sometimes like I've, I've talked to people who have told me like that they work for organizations where this is not the organization's message. The organization will say something like, you know, um, we need to have these welfare reforms because it'll make chickens lives better. But really what, what they're doing, like really what their motivation is, is they want to make 
um, animal products too expensive to be affordable and to sort of drive away um, consumers that way. And if you look at some recent cases in California over the last couple of years, it, it does look like there's some connection between the increased prices that have come from the implementation of certain kinds of enrichment facility, like practices and, uh, and lowering production. Mm. So what, what I wonder is when things like that happen, um, does that make you think that some people should be pushing for changes in legislation? Um, no, I don't think, I, I, I think it's, um, I mean, is, isn't that answered by supply and demand? So wherever, wherever, wherever the um, demand changes, then there's, there's going to be some people who supply that. And, and by implication, it means that whatever was being supplied before that, there's going to be less demand for it. So, you know, from, from a kind of supply and demand situation, you've got a, a, an adjustment going on mm. all the time, although there are delays to it, which is why people say just going vegan is not saving anyone, right? So there's, there, is, there, is, there is that kind of problem. What, what, I, what I tend to think is important in, in this conversation is um, I, I call it, um, because I'm a sociologist and I think about culture, mm-hmm. I talk about social turbulence. Mm. And what I mean by that is that we as animal rights people are kind of creating shit and cre- creating a fuss. Mm-hmm. This creates social turbulence. And the way it comes out at the other end is not, it's not easy to actually kind of work out what, what, what it is and what our part, part of it was. But I can tend to think there's probably enough evidence to su- suggest that if we cause enough of a fuss, Somewhere down the line, it's going to get sorted out. Hmm. The, the welfareist would say, no, we need to be right in, in there do, doing, the, doing the kind of pushing. Mm-hmm. The cultural pushing on its own is not enough. For I, t- I tend to think that our job is actually to influence the cultural shift. And going back to legislation, politicians are followers and not leaders. Mm-hmm. They follow the money, they follow the vote. And... If you create cultural change, you will end up with uh, legal change in the same way as moral rights become codified into legal rights. So you get the moral rights first. Well, you get the rights-based turbulence, and then you get the welfare reforms. You don't have to go in there asking for the welfare reforms. Got it. You, you, you kind of let, let that bit sort itself out. Hmm. And okay. I'm, not, I'm not quite sure whether you can influence it that much. I see. So I think it's very complicated. Well, well. Totally. I mean, I, I think like, so I think you're, you're posing a different mechanism than the one that people like uh, White Coat Waste Project want to want to have. So we have um, like our job as activists is to create turbulence and to try to, you know, stir people up, get, get these changes in consciousness, changes in thinking about animal mm. issues, try to break down some of these barriers and different yeah. civilizations and all that. And then once we do that, we, we try to produce these cultural shifts and then the political mechanisms just do their thing. And we don't need to intervene directly on that. I, I, think, yeah, I, I, I think so. On the grounds that I, I always say that our number one problem is cultural speciesism. Got it. If, if we can't undermine that, then the other animals are, are pretty well screwed, right? But okay. if we can undermine that, then it will have all kinds of effects that we can't necessarily predict. You know, mm-hmm. we, we, we wouldn't be able to see the trajectory and we wouldn't be able to give you a linear kind of um, blueprint or anything like that. It's just that stuff will happen because of what we're doing. But, okay. but there's no, we, we, we can't claim, we can't claim cause, causality so, so, so easy. And that's the bit that the welfare don't like because they want to be able to claim that they did it. Got it. They, you know, they, they've got to pay the wages and they've also got to claim the victories, you see. Well, I, I think that's part of it. I think the other part is that there's a difference in the evidence that we're using. Where I think you and I are really interested in the social movements literature, they're mm-hmm. just in the behavioral economics literature. And they're like, what can we learn from all these advertising executives? And there it's like, you know, cause and cause and effect. We need to do this intervention to create these changes. And um, what the, the, the limits of our activism are the limits of what we can measure. Mm-hmm. I, I think for, for, for that area of activism. Um, but I think one place we might like they might push back still is to say, well, it looks like um, and I don't, I've never heard them say this, but here's you know, I'd want to say in response. It seems like there is 
somebody who has to write the new law and somebody who has to go in and do the lobbying and somebody who has to say, you know, look, here's these shifts in um, the culture and we need to respond to them. Mm. And I, so, so like, how, like, what would you say to that to say that, you know, maybe an activist yeah. should take some of those roles? Well, yeah, yeah, eventually, <laughs> as uh, Manuel would say in uh, Hope Tell Us, but um, it's, a question, it's a question of when. And um, my critique then is that if we go too early, mm -hmm. we end up with a lot of stuff we don't want, which is, which is exactly what we've kind of had with legislation so far. We, we're never satisfied with it because it never comes out well because it's been framed and enacted by speciesists and then monitored and policed by speciesists and all that. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the fact that at the moment, everything is too speciesist. Once that changes, then more of us will be able to get in there and really change things because we'd have socio-economic, socio-political power. It's, it's, a, it's a question of when, and it's, and it's also a numbers game. Once we get, it's, it's the same as the argument is that, well, you, you vegans cause harm, harm to other animals through your buying whatever you buy. And, we, and I say, well, yeah, but there are certain things that structurally we don't have the power to alter yet. Like, for example, um, a farmer once sent to me in the 1990s this video of all these combine harvesters coming over a United States kind of prairie in line, these massive machines. And they're going, well, look at all the other animals that you're killing there. And I said, well, why well, can't stop that right now? But as soon as I can, I will. Hmm. Right. So the problems of veganism, the solution is to have more vegans. We need more vegans to solve the problems of veganism. At, at the moment, there are certain structural things we can't do anything about. We haven't got enough power. Mm -hmm. It's the same as we can't bring in the kind of good laws because the, we, we don't have the power yet. I see. There will, there will come a time. It's a question of when. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, I, I think back to Marx a little bit, and I want to connect that to what you just said. Like, like Marx thought that we needed to have capitalism um, develop the means of production until like an industrialized society, and, mm -hmm. and then the proletariat could, you know, take over all the factories yeah. and all that afterwards. That's the vanguard and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. And, yeah. It, and it seems to me like that's one way we could conceptualize uh, what, what groups like Impossible Foods are doing, where what they're doing is they're trying to transform our systems of production so that um, the society will be in a place where it can um, be more, easy, more, more, more ready to respond to the shifts yeah. in the culture, where it all sort of works in, in, in concert with, with, with each other. Um, but that being said, you know, the, the work of the... Uh, impossible foods is not vegan advocacy like that's no. not their market um and i think the people make like i make mean all, all you've got to do though is understand that i mean mm -hmm. i i agree with that i mean that that's part of the kind of reducitarian program right that I've always accepted kind of like well you know you've got people like tobias leonard saying you know you're going to get a lot of people who are not vegan buying all these vegan stuff and that's going to mean something well that's true yeah. right but that doesn't mean that that's what we have to advocate got it you know you're reducitarians, you, you advocate that. Mm -hmm. If you're a vegetarian, you advocate vegetarians. What tends to happen when people in the movement call for movement unity, mm -hmm. that's always meant the same thing in the movement. It means that the welfare is say to the rightists, do welfare with us because they're not going to do rights with us. And it means that the vegetarians say to the vegans, do vegetarianism with us because they're mm -hmm. not going to do veganism. Although a lot of them do now actually, you know, but, Good. But that, that's the dynamic there is, is the fact that all, all we've got to do is go, well, okay, well, to, to the extent that impossible foods means X, Y, and Z, yeah, it's not a vegan thing, but that's not a problem. Okay, I mean, they, they've even gone to the extent of saying, we don't care what vegans think about us. It's not meant for you. Well, okay, so that's all right. Isn't it? You know, it's not meant for us. So we don't, we don't, we don't have to particularly jump up and down too much about it it's just it, that's what's happening and in, in a in a, cap, in a capitalist system it's inevitable it's got a lot of problems and it's got a lot of dangers because you're going to get a lot of people doing vegan things mm -hmm. and they're not vegans they don't have the vegan mindset and so as soon as it's as soon as it's it's kind of um uh, politics then to pull out they will mm -hmm. and and in the meantime they'll probably bought a load of vegan companies 
and then we, we might we might have a slump then because there's we've kind of like you know ruined our ground base or something that's yeah. a danger but it's also i mean capitalism and a monster hmm. that's what's going to happen you know they they're, they're going to see a market and they're going to jump on, onto it and there's nothing that we can do about that because they they are the rich people they're the ones with the power there's nothing we can do about Bruce Friedrich and his beyond all that and all the rest of it all that not nothing that vegans can do about it because they're going to do it they've got the money to do all that they're going to go ahead anyway. Richard Branson is going to do it. Bill Gates is going to do it. For whatever reason, they're doing it. Our job as vegans is to keep talking about veganism. That, I think that's a really powerful way to, to end this, this, uh, this call. Oh, um, right. Our job is to talk about veganism. Well, well th thank you so yeah, much. We're, ve we're vegan activists. That's, that's, what, that's our job. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. Thank you so much for sitting down with me and having this, this conversation. Really enjoy getting to know you. Um, yes, uh, yeah, and, uh, and me too. Yeah, thanks, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thank you. Um, so thanks also to our viewers. Thanks so much for watching this and um, hope you have a great day. Yeah, bye viewers. <laughs>